a comparative advantage in producing a high-tech product like computer software. Similarly, Mexico has a comparative advantage in producing goods where skill doesn't matter so much, such as agricultural products, uh, corn, for example. Well, to see how globalization affects production, let's do a thought experiment. Let's look at production before globalization takes place. And then we'll imagine that barriers to trade between the US and Mexico are removed. And we'll look at production after the trade barriers have been removed, after globalization occurs. And the difference between the two can be attributed to globalization. So, so let's do that. Before trade has occurred, if Americans are to be able to consume both software and corn, American companies have to produce both because we're assuming that they can't get these goods from overseas because the, the barriers to trade are too high. And similarly, Mexican companies are going to have to produce both software and corn for their consumers. But there's a sense in which when Mexico, when Mexican companies produce software, that is an inefficient use of their labor force. Their labor force is better designed, according to the theory, to produce corn because most of their labor force is unskilled. And so if uh, the Mexican production is diverted into software, that is an inefficient use of the, of the labor force. Uh, and in fact, low-skilled Mexican workers will be hurt by this software production because if, if those companies that are producing software were producing corn instead, they would have to be hiring low-skill workers to harvest the corn. Because they're producing software, they don't need the low-skill workers. And so that reduces the demand for low-skill workers. And at the same time, the software production raises the demand for high-skill workers because software uh, places heavy demands on, on high-skill workers. So because Mexico is producing software before globalization occurs, there's going to be upward pressure on high-skill wages, downward pressure on low-skill wages. The, the low-skill workers are not needed so much. The high-skill workers are needed a lot. OK, so now what happens when the trade barriers are removed and there's globalization? Well, now it's no longer necessary for the US to produce corn. And it wasn't so efficient for them to produce corn anyway because they had this highly skilled workforce. So they will shift from corn to software and import corn from Mexico. And similarly, Mexico will shift production away from software to corn, and they'll import their software from the US. And what effect will this have on wages? Well, Mexico will now be producing more corn and less software before. So that will raise the demand for low-skill workers, because corn makes a lot of use of low-skill labor. So the, the demand for low-skill work is increased. The demand for high-skill labor is reduced. And so high-skill wages will fall. 
low skill wages will rise and inequality will be reduced. This is the classic argument that all supporters of globalization used to give for why globalization would help the poor. It was this argument. And th as I said, this is a, not a new argument. This argument goes back hundreds of years, and it worked for many, many, for many, many decades. It worked in all previous globalizations. But it failed for the current globalization. And the question is, why did it fail? Uh, one notable success of, of the theory of comparative advantage was in the, in the late 19th century. There, globalization uh, came about because the cost of transporting goods across the Atlantic Ocean went down. Uh, shipping costs went down. Uh, now, Europe, in, at that point, had the bigger proportion of low-skilled workers compared with the US. And in fact, what we saw, which was exactly what the theory predicted, was a fall in inequality in Europe because of globalization. So low skill wages rose, high skill wages came down in Europe. But as I say, the, the, the theory has not worked for the recent globalization. And so uh, for that reason, there has been an anti-globalization movement, which has, which has uh, suggested that perhaps globalization wasn't such a good idea after all. I have to say I don't agree with the idea that globalization is not a good idea because as I began, as I said at the beginning of my talk, even though inequality has increased, so has average prosperity as a result of globalization. So, so globalization has not been uh, a out and out failure. It's had many successes too. But uh, we do want to understand why inequality has, in, has increased. And that, and that is a, a project uh, that I have been undertaking to, uh, to study uh, together with an economist, Michael Kramer, uh, at uh, Harvard. And let me tell you a little bit about the theory that we propose, which we think uh, Im improves on the theory of comparative advantage. But the, the essential starting place is to go back to thinking about globalization as the internationalization of production. So I mentioned before that um, if, if you want computer assistance in the US or Europe, you're going to get someone in India. That's an example of the internationalization of production. In fact, the very way that computers are, are manufactured these days is an international effort. Uh, typically, computers will be designed in the US. They will be uh, programmed somewhere else, perhaps in Europe, and then they will be put together in China. So, so uh, complicated products like computers, uh, like uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, are typically produced internationally. They, they, they cannot be confined to, to single countries. 
So let's think of globalization as the internationalization of production. But, so that's one ingredient. Uh, another important ingredient to the theory is the idea that uh, labor doesn't just come in two varieties, high skill and low skill. There are actually many uh, skill levels in between. Uh, for, my, for my purposes today, uh, I'm going to assume that there are four levels. Uh, but that's just to simplify the discussion. In fact, there are many more than just four levels. Another ingredient is the idea that when something is produced, there are typically multiple tasks that have to be performed. Uh, modern production consists of breaking up the production process into different tasks which different people do. Again, I'm going to simplify matters to, and suppose that there are just two tasks. There's what we might call the managerial task, the task that managers perform. And we'll suppose that this is relatively sensitive to the skill level of the manager. Uh, and that there's also a task of the subordinates, which is not so sensitive to skill. So, so two tasks. I'll also suppose that there are two countries, just as in our comparative advantage example, a rich country and a poor country, say the, the United States and Mexico, or the United States and uh, Cambodia. And the rich country, uh, we'll suppose has workers of skill level, skill levels A and B, the poor country skill levels C and D, where A is bigger than B is bigger than C is bigger than D. So the reason why the rich country is rich is because it has workers of higher skill levels than the poor country. Now, how does output get produced? Well, it, it gets produced by putting two people together uh, to perform the two tasks involved. So output is produced by matching or putting together a manager and a subordinate. And how much output gets produced depends on the skill levels of the people occupying those tasks, uh, those positions. Now I'm going to use a little bit of math here. Uh, I, I hope this, this doesn't uh, distress anyone. Uh, if, if it does, just, just close your eyes, because it'll, it'll all be over soon. <laughs> uh, but I'm going to suppose that output equals the skill level of the manager squared. Now the reason for squaring the manager's skill level is just to get across the idea that output is very sensitive to the manager's skill times the skill level of the subordinate. Output is not so sensitive to the subordinate's skill level. So for example, um, if the manager had skill level four and the subordinate had skill level three, output would be four squared, four times four, times the skill level of the subordinate three, or 48. That's, that's just uh, one possible example. Now, The way that workers are matched with one another uh, is going to depend on the, on the environment. It's going to depend on the distribution of skills that are available. And that's, that's why globalization is going to be important. Globalization will change the distribution of available skills, because now you'll be able to get skills of people who live in different countries 
as well as skills of people who live in your own country. But just to give you an example of the different kinds of patterns we could have, let's imagine that the population consists of two workers of skill three, I'll call them three workers, and there are two workers of skill level four, I'll call those four workers. Now one way that they could be matched is that a four worker could be matched with another, sorry, a four worker could be matched with a three worker, and the other four worker could be matched with the other three worker. Um, I'll call this cross-matching because in this case, uh, each worker is matched with, a, with another worker of a different skill level. So that's cross-matching, and this produces a total output of 96. Another way that they could have been matched is that the four worker could have been matched with an, the other four worker, the three worker could have been matched with the other three worker. Uh, this is what's called homogeneous matching because now uh, the, the manager and the subordinate have the same skill level, but this produces output which is less, it's only 91, and therefore if we think that there's uh, competition for workers, we, we would expect that we will get this pattern of matching because it produces higher output. Competition gives you greater efficiency, and greater efficiency here means this output rather than this output. But this, this conclusion that we get homogeneous matching depends very much on the distribution of skills that is available. If we change that distribution, if we change that distribution, and so now we have two four workers and two two workers instead of th two three workers, we get a different pattern of matching. Now, if we compare cross-matching with homogeneous matching, we find that homogeneous matching gives, gives rise to higher output, 72 rather than 64. So we don't always get cross-matching, we don't always get homogeneous matching, it all depends on the distribution of skills. Well, this, this brings me to the comparison between what happens before globalization and what happens after globalization. Remember I said that uh, the rich country will have skill levels A and B, the poor country will have skill levels C and D, which are lower. Uh, what pattern of matching do we get before globalization? Well, it can be shown that we will get I'm not going to go through the arguments, uh, but it's, it's, it's not difficult. Uh, it can be shown that the, that the pre-globalization pattern that we will get is that A workers will be matched with B workers in the rich country, and C workers will be matched with D workers in the poor country. So we will have cross-matching in both countries before globalization. So, before production has been internationalized. What happens when the barriers to international production come down? We get a dramatically different pattern. Now the C workers from the poor country are matched with the B workers in the rich country. The D workers are left all to themselves and the A workers are left all to themselves. Think of it this way. Uh, before you could have uh, international production, uh, the D workers got the benefits of working with higher skilled people, the C workers. But once international production became possible, the C workers got a better opportunity overseas. They got to match with the B workers that was very good for the C workers, but not so good for the D workers. The D workers were now 
forced to fend for themselves. They were left to their own devices. So let's explore the implications of this for wages. We see that before globalization, the, the D workers match with the C workers. That was, that was good for them because they were working with higher skill people. That meant that they were more productive. But after, after globalization, the D workers are left by themselves. That means that their wages will fall as a result of globalization. At the same time, the wages of the C workers go up because they now have this new opportunity, the opportunity to work in an international company with B workers. Think of the C workers as the, as the Indian call center workers who now have the opportunity to work for uh, Microsoft or, or Dell uh, overseas. So the, the consequence of all of this is that inequality has risen. The gap between the C workers and the D workers' wages has gone up as a result of globalization. Very different argument from comparative advantage. Now what, it, what do we uh, learn from this argument when it comes to policy? What, if, 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 if we're worried about inequality, what do we do according to this story? Well, the whole problem, according to this story, is that the D workers' skills are too low for them to be attractive to global markets. If we could somehow raise the skill levels of these D workers, they too would have international employment opportunities, matching opportunities, and, and they too would see their wages rise. So somehow we have to raise these skill levels of the D workers. The problem is that raising skill levels is expensive. It, it, it costs something, and the question is who's going to pay for it? Well, producers are not going to pay for it, or they're not going to pay for enough of it, because if, if, a, if a producer, a company, invests in raising a D worker's skill level, that worker can then go off and work for some other company. You know, we don't have, we don't have slavery, so people uh, ca cannot be forced to work for the company that invests in them. And, but that means that the investment in training that the company has made is lost. So producers are not likely to invest enough in education to solve the inequality problem. And, of course, the workers themselves can't make the investment because they're too poor to do so. They, they are, after all, at the bottom of the economic spectrum. So that means that some third party is going to have to make the investments. It could be uh, domestic governments. It could be some international agency, an NGO perhaps. It could take the form of foreign aid. It could be some combination of all of the above. That is, it could be uh, a, gov a domestic government offering a subsidy to a, com a, a private company for training its workers. But, but some uh, 
third party is going to have to get into the act to solve the inequality problem. It's not going to happen on its own. And so if you accept this theory, and I think there is strong evidence behind this theory, we come away with the conclusion not that we should try to stop globalization, because after all, globalization does, on average, increase prosperity, but rather to make the investments in low-skill workers, the D workers of the world, to enable them to benefit from globalization too. That's the message. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Maskin. Uh, any question from the floor? We have like uh, only a few questions. Okay. A few questions, please. Uh, microphone, could you please? If, <coughs> if the D workers raise their productivity, not quite to the level of the C workers, but to the level of the C workers minus epsilon, some small amount. Would they still be frozen out? Yes, so, so, so that's a good question. How, how, uh, how far do we have to raise skill levels for it to make a difference? And the answer is we do not have to raise it all the way to the to the sea level. We just have to raise it to the point, going back to, to this picture here, we just have to raise it to the point where it becomes attractive for at least some of the sea workers to match with D workers, or it becomes attractive for some, at least some of the B workers to match with D workers. That is well short. To, to do that, uh, skill level of D workers can still be well short of, of the C level. Uh, the, the, the problem with the picture as it stands is that the D workers are so far down mm -hmm. that they're unattractive to both of these groups. So they're, they're left by themselves. And that, and that, I would submit, is, is what has happened in many developing countries around the world. The D workers simply have nothing attractive to offer global markets. But that means essentially that <clears throat> the distribution of your skill measured by some scalar, some number, uh, is, is almost discrete. It's not continuous. OK. Uh, it, in this example, in this example, it, it's discrete. Of course, in reality, it, it, it's going to be closer to continuous. But the same argument that I have made in the case of four levels of so skill. More, more At least some. So, we're, 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 not going to, we're not going to solve the problem of inequality completely. That, that is beyond our powers. But we can, we can certainly improve the inequality problem significantly by moving some D workers. I have the one, gen, uh, one observation and one question. The first observation is that your theory lays upon the fact that there is a teamwork between people of different skills. And secondly, your second implication, policy implication, uh, seem to uh, assume that uh, the result depends very much uh, that the skill of the workers are, spe are general skill, not specific skill. 
what happens if workers acquire specific skills? What happens to your theory? Right. Uh, so, so you're quite correct. Uh, that I, I'm assuming for, for the purposes of this argument that at least some skill is general. By, and by general skill, I mean that it's transferable from one company to another, from one task to another. If, if all skills were completely specific to the task at hand, then we would not have a problem. And the reason we would not have a problem is that now we wouldn't have to have governments get into the action. All investment could be made by the companies themselves. If, it, if, if I'm a worker and you're considering hiring me and the skill, but, and, and you're considering giving me training, if the, if the skills I learn can only be used by you then you don't have to worry about so losing your investments. Does that assumption affect your uh, conclusion on inequality? It's, it's not, uh, uh, it's going to, uh, yes, it, it, it's going to af affect the conclusion on inequality because in a world where all skills are, speci are completely specific, it will pay workers, it will pay workers to train, uh, sorry, it will pay companies to train D workers. We won't have any D workers left anymore because they will all be privately trained. It's precisely because not all skills are specific, if there is at least some degree to which they are general, that, that dilutes the incentive for private companies to do all of the investment themselves. So there, and, and so if we're going to do something about inequality, somebody else, government or NGOs or international organizations have to get into the act. It's not going to happen through the market itself. Now, yeah. if the world changed in such a way that production technique requires a combination of teamwork between C and D, Yes. Then, then your result will change. Like, if D workers yeah. are always required in the combination, D workers are required. Some kind of well, all right. The, so the assumption in, in this model is that we can use workers of any skill level uh, for any task, but the problem is that if we use workers of sufficiently low skill, we won't get much output. Uh, that, that, that's the critical assumption. The, the idea that we can, we can always use lower skill people, but then if we do that, we'll sacrifice output. Yeah, good questions. There are also questions back there. Yeah. And, no, I was, uh, what, you, you showed two models of globalization. Right. One, I mean, the old one and the new one. Right. Can they be compared? I mean, because when you talk about reducing the tariffs, you're talking about uh, products. And when you're talking about computer software, they don't have any tariffs. I mean, they move around the world without paying tariff. I mean, according to the WTO, they are tariffs zero. And when we are talking about corns, they have tariffs. So can be these two models of globalization compared? Well, in, in fact, I think uh, both, both models uh, have validity. Uh, so so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not arguing that the old model, the theory of comparative advantage, is irrelevant uh, any, at this point. Uh, of course, it, it's still uh, has some explanatory power. But the point is that so much of production is international now that 
the theory of comparative advantage is not sufficient by itself to explain what we observe. And so you should think of this new theory as not replacing the theory of comparative advantage, but rather supplementing it and going beyond the old theory to explain the, the new reality. The, the, can, the, can, I, can I say something more? Because in the, old, in the old model, I mean, we have movement of products, right, goods. That's right. And it was produced by reducing the tariffs. This globalization is produced because there is a technological that, revolution, right? And there is a technology advancement that allows, I mean, this trading of software around the globe without reducing. This is important from the political point of view that some of the NGOs are opposing the uh, red FTAs, right? Because they say, I mean, reducing the tariff will increase inequality. But there is a globalization being produced, not because of reducing the tariff, because we have a technological revolution that is different in the case of software, for example. Well, uh, uh, reducing tariffs uh, is important as well. That, that is, uh, if, you, if you are assembling computers in China, uh, then it's important that tariffs between China and the rest of the world be low in order to get those computers out of China. Otherwise, they'll be stuck there. Uh, so, so, so reduction of tariffs does play a role in, in this story. Uh, but you're quite right that uh, the, the technological revolution which allowed companies to coordinate production across different continents to be able to design in the U.S. and assemble in China, that, that technological capability is also important. And, 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 and it's, that, it's that new technological capability which distinguishes this globalization from previous ones. The, in, the internationalization of production. And it's why the theory of comparative advantage, the old theory, is no longer the end of the story, why it's no longer enough to explain what has happened. Uh, you, you should get the attention of... Hi. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I don't know if this question has been asked already, but I couldn't quite hear from the, big, uh, from the front. But I have a question related to the different uh, skill levels. Yes. Um, so you mentioned that the C workers would have um, a better opportunity to match with higher skilled workers, uh, B workers from the richer country. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, what though would make the B workers match with the C workers where whereas they were better off matched with higher skilled A-level workers earlier before the, the oh, trade. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, okay. I, I should emphasize that just because the B workers used to be matched with the A workers and now they're matched with the C workers does not mean that the B workers are worse off. The B workers are actually better off too. And the reason, the reason that's so is because the C workers are paid less than the A workers, and so there's more left over for the B workers. So just, be, just because you're matched with someone of lower skill doesn't necessarily mean that you are worse off. The B workers are, are, are better off uh, because of globalization. The C workers are better off. The B workers are better off. It's the D workers who suffer, and the A workers actually suffer too. Uh, but we don't care about the A workers because they're rich anyway. <laughs> so, so it's the D workers we, uh, who, who, who really uh, get the bad deal here, and it's the D workers that we, that we need to uh, do something about. So uh, what is the reason why the, uh, this mechanism doesn't apply to previous globalization? Because, be, be, it, it's because uh, previous globalizations were, were not 
it's essentially about the internationalization of production. So in, in, in previous globalizations, we did not have people in Europe jointly producing goods with people from the US. We had, we certainly had trade of goods between the two, but the goods were either produced in Europe and sent to the US or produced in the US and sent to Europe. The, the, the distinctive feature of this globalization is that we have these multi-country goods, country, uh, goods which are produced by people from different countries. <laughs> And, and, and that makes a huge difference to the implications on wages. In other words, production taking place in different under different groups. Right. Right. That's right. Um, thank you, Professor Maskin. Uh, thank you for giving us a great lecture today. Uh, my name is Guibo Shen from China. Uh, what I learned from your lecture is that uh, people should be educated. People should improve their skill level. And uh, I have, you know, my concern is that what if, you know, everybody's educated, everybody, you know, is smart, you know, just like you. And <laughs> you don't want people to, all people to be like me. <laughs> and who's going to iron your clothes? You know, who's going to uh, make, you know, motorbikes for you? And the other question is about the application of the theory. Uh, we know that uh, lots of other elements and forces are going to influence the application of a theory, right? Uh, such as political system. Uh, say the theory is very good, but how can we you know, apply that theory in, in a country like Myanmar, you know, with a total, totally different uh, social and uh, political uh, environment? And uh, what kind of efforts we should make to make sure that we can apply the theory successfully in a cer certain circumstance? Thank you very much. Okay. Well, on, on the first question, you're asking what if everyone could be educated, everybody could be trained. Not like me, but, but in, a <laughs> in a useful way. <laughs> uh, that would be great. Uh, the one problem, of course, is that, as I was suggesting, education is, does not come for free. It requires a, a, a serious investment. Someone has to pay for it. And so in the world as it currently exists, it is beyond the resource limitations to educate everyone to be A workers. That, that's simply not in the feasible set. But that isn't to say that we can't make a big improvement over the current reality. We, we, we may not be able to ev educate everyone, but we can, we can educate a lot more D workers than, than, than we're doing. So, so it's moving in the right direction that I'm arguing for, not, re not achieving some utopia, which is, which is uh, unrealistic. Now, on, on the second question, uh, what can we do uh, to, uh, to bring the, the countries of the world to the point where considerations like these are even applicable? Uh, the, 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 the sad fact is that there are some countries uh, which are still more or less left out of the globalization project altogether. And you mentioned uh, uh, Miramar as, as an example. S sadly, uh, Miramar, uh, partly through deliberate choices by its government, it has not uh, has not uh, been able to take advantage of, of the possible fruits of globalization nearly to the extent that you know, that that Thailand has, or uh, that Mexico has, 
or that Brazil has. Uh, so, uh, one, uh, I guess for, for teachers like me, educators like me, uh, the, um, the task is to, to try to make clear that although globalization brings problems with it, such as inequality, and I've been emphasizing inequality today, but there are other problems too, uh, globalization is not something to be feared. That, that is, there is something you can do about the problems. And there are, of course, great benefits as well. So, uh, so th through, I, I hope that through, through education, through understanding, uh, countries which have deliberately cut themselves off from globalization will reconsider and join the, the international, more, more thoroughly join the international community. Thank you very much. First, I'm asking, in a globalized world, it is quite likely that it's uh, a worker will relocate to this CD country and at the same time, A could be working with 2D, for example, and the D can be improved to D plus. And how would that look like? So, so you're, you're suggesting that A workers may actually migrate and, 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 and move to the other country. Well, uh, if you actually accept the premise of this theory, that's actually not going to happen. And, and the real, uh, the, the, the premise behind this theory is that communication costs have been reduced to the point where it's no longer necessary to move to another country to enjoy the wages of that other country. Uh, notice that in the arguments that I was making, the C workers did not have to move to the rich country to match with the B workers. They, they stayed in their own country. It was the international uh, employer that, that, that hired them uh, that, uh, that did the moving. The workers just stayed at home. So uh, th 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 that's also an important difference between the contemporary world and the world of 100 years ago. 100 years ago, uh, if you wanted to earn wages comparable to American workers' wages, you had to move to America. You don't have to do that anymore. You can stay put and, and get hired by a multinational company instead. Sorry to take up your time again. <clears throat> Are you saying that you have actually de facto now equalization of wages of the same skill level? It, well, uh, that would be an exaggeration. I, 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 of course, there are still important international differences uh, uh, for the same skill level, but the differences are shrinking. And, and the differences but in have. The model, it is in the model, yes. In, in the pure model that I showed you, they are equalized. And, and in, in the model, it doesn't matter where you are. The same skill level will be paid the same no matter what part of the world you live in, in a world which is globalized. In, re, in reality, we are not completely globalized. There are still some differences from country to country, but they are much smaller than they used to be. Uh, I have two questions. First, uh, unlike the Ricardian comparative advantage theory, uh, you, uh, you mentioned that the A worker would be uh, worse off. So uh, would this imply that the inequality in the rich country will be better after trade? 
So you're saying, uh, will, will inequality be, be better uh, after globalization in the, in the rich country? Um, it could go either way, actually. Uh, it, uh, it, it, it depends on the numbers. Uh, for, for some parameter values, it could be improved, but I could choose other parameter values uh, where we actually got more inequality. Uh, I would, to do that, I would, I, I actually need more than four, I'm, I've been working for, for simplicity with four levels, but if we had more than four levels, it, it could, the inequality could go either way in the rich country. However, in the poor country, inequality definitely goes up as a result of, of global. Yeah, and uh, the second question, uh, you already mentioned that uh, for many Southeast Asian countries, we have seen the result, uh, similar to Mexico, but uh, let's imagine that, uh, that uh, like Thailand in the future, we will trade uh, with both the richer countries and maybe with the uh, poorer countries like Cambodia and Laos. Uh, does, does your theory uh, have some uh, strong prediction on, on what would happen in uh, middle country like that? Right. So, so so Thailand is, is, a, is a country in between. It's not one of the poorest countries in the world. Uh, uh, Cambodia and Laos are, are poorer, uh, but, uh, but China is richer. Uh, and, and what will happen, according to the theory you're asking, uh, if, uh, if, if we remove trade barriers, and in fact, that's a, precisely what the uh, the China ASEAN free trade uh, area is trying to do to remove trade barriers. Uh, and, and, and the answer is that for a country in the middle like Thailand, it could go either way. Uh, th there is no strong prediction. It, inequality could increase as a result of, of, the, of the new free trade area or it, or it could go down. But for, for Cambodia and Laos, it's pretty clear that inequality will rise as a result. Um, global, didn't globalization start because companies, this current phase of globalization start because companies went looking for de-workers? And in an example like China and Vietnam are prime examples where they went looking for de-workers for simply because they were unskilled and they were, uh, um, had very low wages and there was opportunities to skill them up. In a country like uh, Thailand, um, that 65% of its GDP is focused on exports, but the farm workers are actually very marginalised out of that and could be considered the D workers. Isn't that really a political problem as opposed to a globalisation problem? Well, f first of all, I... I uh do not completely agree with your premise that the, that the current globalization occurred because companies went looking for de-workers. The, the, the current globalization occurred because uh, costs, communication costs, coordination costs, managerial costs fell to the point where it it became feasible and and uh, desirable and and and, and uh, in some cases desirable to hire workers from uh, a remote part of the world. Uh, before, if you were an American company or a British company or a French company. Uh, it, it, it would have been very expensive for you to outsource a large part of your operation to Asia. Now it's, now it's cheap to do. And the implication of it being cheap to do is that yes, it now becomes uh, uh, profitable sometimes to hire uh, fairly uh, low-skill workers, 
not, typically not, uh, the, the workers who are not getting hired are workers without any skills altogether, the, the D workers. They're, they're, they're more like C workers. Uh, but, other, but other workers who are getting hired uh, might have higher skills. So, so globalization has, has made possible uh, the, uh, the participation of a whole range <coughs> of skill levels in the international arena where b b before uh, these workers would not have been, had international opportunities. The, 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 the only people uh, who are uh, not getting so many opportunities are, are, the, are the people at the very bottom. Uh, and that I, uh, yes, I mean, you could say that that's a political problem because uh, because the governments of these people aren't uh, giving them the economic wherewithal to make themselves attractive to international markets. But at another level, I would, I would argue that it's, that it's a, an economic problem. Uh, uh, th these people simply aren't employable anymore. OK. Thank you very much, Professor Meskin. And thank you again for uh, our lovely participants. I know that uh, there are still a lot of questions, but you will have an opportunity to discuss with Professor when we have the refreshment outside. OK? So. Uh, on this occasion, I'd like to uh, have an honor of our president of the University of the Thai Chamber of Commerce to present our token of appreciation to Professor Maskin. May I call upon Associate Professor Dr. Jerry Usawat. We also would like to have the group picture from the administrators. Yeah. May I invite uh, the administrators to have the group picture with Professor Maskin. Thank you. And for our participants, you can enjoy the refreshment outside, and we would love you to come back again whenever we have this kind of special event. Thank you very much.